ethical points about the life and death and uh, I mean several deaths that so far we have experienced uh, and uh, now we are in this uh, present life and so we have to die from this as well in order to, uh, to, to enter another world or another life and so on and so forth. So we have been uh, the, the matter and then the vegetal and then the animal and now we are human beings but the, the road is not ended. So there are a lot of other stages that we can go through according to Rumi go through so we sacrifice ourselves so to speak in order to become angels and from the angelhood we again can be sacrificed in order to become non-existence so this non-existence in the Rumi poetry does not mean non-existence in the literal sense of the word non-existence means non-material because according to Rumi this world seems existent and because of this he calls it the existent world and the unseen world does not seem to be existent because our criterion of existence is materiality I mean the common sense criterion of existence is materiality whatever is material we suppose it to be really existent and whatever cannot be seen is invisible is not sensible is not tangible is not edible that we, we call it non-existent and because of this, usually people think that the unseen world does not really objectively exist because we cannot feel it, we cannot sense it, we cannot touch it, and so on. So that's why there is a kind of, uh, what is it, a score or, uh, or uh, uh, scorn in it when he calls it uh, non-existence. In, in the same story, actually, he tells us the story of the Mary uh, to her, to whom appeared the angel. Now the angel said to the Mary, don't uh, be frightened from me. I come from the world of non-existence. So exactly, that is the word. That Rumi actually tells us and shows what he means by the existence. He says to Mary, I am a very sophisticated figure. I am both objective and subjective. I have got, so to speak, a leg inside your soul and a leg outside your soul. I am both in the objective world and in the subjective world. These are all the descriptions that Rumi gives from the angel or the spirit who appeared to, to Mary in order to give birth to the to, 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 to conceive her now uh, he said I am coming from the world of non-existence that Adam man, I am the king of non-existence that Adam man shaham sahib alam I am the king of the world of non-existence now when he says here that after this existence, this material existence, we become non-existence, means we become immaterial. We live a second life. We become absolutely different. Of course, we do not know what it is and how it is, because according to Rumi, it is howless. We do not know how it is. We only know in a negative way. We know something about it in negative. It is not like the life that we are living here. The other word is not, as I said, comprised of the opposites, uh, of numbers. So that is a different goal altogether. But the, the exact quality we do not have. The exact definition we do not have. And that appears to the uh, mystics in their uh, transcendental experiences that they uh, have. So these are, I mean, you know, consecutive deaths that we so far have had and we will have some more in, in future therefore according to Rumi we should not be frightened from death because we have uh, perfected ourselves we have become more and more perfect through this consecutive death therefore death is a mark and is a gate to perfection rather than to annihilation so this is the how he sees for a traveler who has got a destination the more he uh, becomes closer to the destination he must be uh, uh, the happier he might be. For uh, a prisoner, the more he gets closer to, uh, to, to getting free, the happier he must become, and so on and so forth. So that is the meaning of the death. Now look at the uh, idea of the feast of sacrifice here. This is again another uh, artful, actually, use of the feast of sacrifice. You know, the feast in, in Islam 
One is the feast of success, which is uh, during the, uh, uh, one of the actually part, uh, parts of the pilgrim to, to Mecca. There actually the pilgrims must uh, uh, perform uh, many things, including sacrificing a ship or a cow or something. So that is the day that they should do this. It is a feast. It's called the feast, feast of sacrifice. Okay, and another feast is the feast of Fetter, which is the end of the Ramadan, ten days from now. Okay, so there are two great feasts in, in Islam. The feast of sacrifice is uh, very well known because, as I said, it belongs to the performance of the Hajj of pilgrim. But Rumi, from his contemplative point of view, he actually sees in the feast of, of sacrifice absolutely a different thing. <coughs> he thinks that it is only a symbol for the lovers in order to sacrifice himself for the beloved. In the pilgrim, when you are going to God, when you are visiting the house of God, there actually you are visiting your beloved in a symbolic uh, way. So there you have to become uh, more and more prepared in order to sacrifice yourself, to sacrifice your soul, so to speak, to make it sacred, to make it holy, the literal meaning of the sacrifice. Uh, what Rumi actually says here, he says uh, <coughs> go asleep or whether it eats something, he nurtures or fattens it for the feast and the slaughter. Let him drive his anger against my intoxicated sword. He is the feast of the sacrifice, and the lover is the buffalo. It is recommended. I mean, all these points are in the mind of Rumi when he, he writes these poems. It is recommended in the law and the regulations of the feast of the sacrifice that the fatter the buffalo is the better. Okay, so you have to you have to offer the best sacrifice that you can offer. That is that is the regulation. That is the recommendation. Of course, you are free to sacrifice whatever, to offer whatever sacrifice. But it is much much better to offer the fattest, like the most precious sacrifice. Now, what Rumi has got in mind here is this: that the lover is himself the sacrifice that he offers to his beloved. Okay? Now, in order to be uh, more valuable, he must uh, have excellences and perfections. It is not good for a lover to be bare. He must be the most knowledgeable, he must be the most perfect in order when he sacrifices himself uh, he would offer the best sacrifice to his beloved. So all these regulations and laws are in his mind when he uses the idea of the feast of sacrifice here and the idea of the buffalo and of course the cow of Moses which comes next. And then to the end of this piece you will see that he brings in the symbolism of jug, the water and the river. So what he originally means is this, that through sacrificing your soul, you are not wasting your soul. You are not destroying your soul. What you do is just you empty or you pour your jug, the water of your jug, into the sea, into the ocean of your beloved. Therefore, the partial soul actually unites with the universal soul. So it becomes united with the universal and uh, it becomes eternal. It's, it actually escapes preachability and escapes annihilation. And uh, it actually uh, not only uh, 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 finds uh, uh, and resumes a, a new life, but also he becomes united with the beloved. Therefore, this is the image that now we have to have from the death. A partial soul actually tries to be united with the universal soul. A jack actually is...